So Jean hails from uh, University of Florida. Thank you. Um, you know, um, it's great to be here, and uh, especially uh, last two days, I heard a lot about double stars. And um, so here, I just want to start with a talk. Uh, double star not only can do the, you know, the, uh, um, um, the, the separation, you know, the move, movements, and there's one thing we can do now, actually, is uh, um, I, I want to highlight with this uh, and the major new discovery we had is a double star. Um, the, it come from, I think it's a Bill's uh, unpublished, not pub it's in the catalog, but not published in the paper, uh, are binaries and with very close uh, separation. And uh, over a few years monitoring, uh, we found that actually these have uh, two giant companions. One is about 11.5 Jupiter mass, the other is about 60 Jupiter mass. So basically it's a giant uh, planet and then brown dwarf kind of uh, you know, uh, around uh, primary. And, but this separation is very small. And uh, you can see that, uh, um, uh, uh, of course, this obviously is based on the BIOS, those, you know, uh, catalog. And, uh, you know, unfortunately, they only have a very small part of it. And uh, so, the, so the, the obvious is very uncertain. But this just gives you the ideas about the double star really um, could be a wild, uh, you know, major test bed for, you know, planet formation. And this, why so special? You look at this one, you probably see that, uh, you know, the binary, close binary, there's not many uh, planets found so far. And, um, and we actually found the most unique one with the two giant companions around that. And then you may go back to this one you can see here is very high eccentric orbits. And of course, this may be kind of the waiting for more astrometry, you know, maybe measurements. So maybe more precise determining these orbits. But this might be the uh, one thing possibility is uh, high eccentricity could be triggered in the, the giant planet formation uh, in, you know, in the early stage of star formation. And uh, this could be uh, important, you know, because this uh, uh, double star you know, in, in the future, it's better you guys work near ground for many years, and um, that could be a you know, very wonderful uh, place to hunt for uh, planets. Not only that, but also to understand, you know, planet formation evolution. And uh, so I want to use this just uh, as an introduction to show you that the double star in, in, indeed is right, right now is in link to, uh, you know, the frontier research of actual planets. And uh, this planet is discovered by uh, this group, you know, um, uh, at Florida. And we use this, you know, Sloan Digital Sky Search Telescope, and uh, we basically developed, uh, you know, this we call the first generation radio velocity instrument. And uh, in fact, this is used uh, in the parameter, and uh, uh, mixed with a median resonance spectrograph, and uh, which I will talk about a little bit more later. And they've been searched for, uh, you know, quite many years, you know, and uh, we we got a large data set of radio velocity in in history, and we're in the middle of process them. And um, some of the discovery I want to highlight here. And this is all published discoveries, you know, uh, all brown dwarf kind of uh, uh, mass range. And uh, the planets one I just showed, the early one, and the, but uh, there's more. It's still waiting for confirmation. And there's a you know, lot of confirmation follow up. And uh, this just gives you the highlights, you know, indeed, you know, can find many of these kind of uh, you know, company, <coughs> some of them actually in the binaries. And, uh, and here is, uh, <coughs> excuse me, landscape. And uh, you can look at, you know, radio velocity, and the uh, planet's discovery in, in domain, and uh, you probably know this is, you know, is the mass of the uh, planet, and this is the period of the planet. And uh, you can see the majority of the known planets is in these you know, territories from like uh, 10 years all the way to uh, you know, now it's almost reached the Earth like planets. But uh, marbles, you know, we have the biggest survey, so we have a lot of binaries, and which a lot of you uh, probably interested in that, you know, we'll publish those. And then uh, we also have a lot of uh, um, uh, in brown dwarf discovered. And then uh, um, now we're starting to fill in this, uh, uh, you know, the planets. So this is a kind of, uh, you can imagine, you know, when we complete our survey and data processing, we are pretty much occupy these regions with uh, maybe hundreds and hundreds uh, of the discovery from this major survey, you know, uh, as part of the Sloan 3 program. And, uh, and uh, you know, I, I just want to uh, bring up, the, you know, why we can do this, you know, with 60 objects instead of, you know, probably know the traditional way people are doing, you know, one object at one times. That's because of this uh, in the parameter, and uh, you know, just uh, Gerald mentioned, you know, in the parameter can do, you know, um, separation of the stars, you know, motion of the star in the in the sky, but in the parameter actually, in terms of in the time domain, you know, and uh, you can do a delay of the two in the parameter, then you can do the Doppler shift measurements as well. So you can imagine, you know, in, in time domain you translate to the space domain, then you can measure separation, you know, the separation, which is equivalent to the like fringe shifts, right? And uh, you can imagine this in the parameter now in the 
ham domain, which means it's a being, you know, you come in, you, you separate the being with the with optical part difference, and then you can create interference. So those interference, once the Doppler shift was called line shifts, and these guys will be moved up and down, and you eventually create Doppler shifts. So that's the whole trick of this technique. And uh, so therefore, they're in the front doing the radio velocity, but then the spec graph is a separate fringe. So therefore, you can put many objects at the same time. So that's why we can do 60 objects in a single observation. And here's just a cartoon show you how we do that. And typical people, you know, use a shell. You can have the resolve lines, very, very high resolution. But now you can, you know, superpose with in the front You see all this in the front in the fringe, the cone. And then it basically, you can use no resolution. And then those fringe, it's it caused by the, you know, double shifts, you know, the two, two, uh, two uh, s s you know, uh, combined beams, and that will create a fringe. If, if line shifts in these directions, you know, move the, the sh uh, fringe. So that way you can measure the fringe shifts to measure the double shifts. So therefore you can use a, a low resolution, medium resolution spec graph, and doing uh, you know, a similar radio velocity as a, as a shell spec graph. So that's the major advantage. So therefore you can open up to do many objects at the same time. That's why we can able to do a big survey in the history. And uh, then based, <coughs> based on the from the method, then we pretty much um, uh, use uh, that to d develop the second generation instrument. And that is, you know, we will go with, uh, you know, uh, no cost instrument. And this time, we not only compared to the first generation, we, we not only doing the temperature control, but also we do the pressure control as well. So therefore, we can control the pressure to a very good level to like one million PSI. And this has been, you know, operated at for a couple of years. And, I wanna and then there's another copy we put at, uh, in China 2.4 meter telescope. And uh, that's about a year ago. And here's some of the early, some kind of demonstration of the, you know, precision you can do. You know, calibration, we can get down to about meter level precision. On sky measurements, we get about two meter, you know, but of course this requires some tuning of the pipeline. And uh, basically show that, uh, you know, this kind of method, you know, uh, with, uh, with the combination in the front with the spec graph, and uh, you can do a very good precision, you know, and the instrument. But right now, we are, the team is really working on, you know, to tune the pipeline to get ready to, uh, you know, push it down to a very high precision level. So that way you can do a, you know, new mass panic survey. <coughs> and uh, here's just highlight, you know, the wild motivation why we generate the center uh, instrument is really want to follow up some of the panic discovery by the, you know, marbles survey. Because marbles will turn into, uh, you know, hundreds of the ca uh, candidates. And here's just a highlight show you you know, this early on from the Marvel survey, you know, every star get like 20, 30 observation, but that accuracy, you, you know, tend to be moderate, you know, maybe a, you know, 30 meter level. And then now uh, we use the, you know, expert follow-up, you can add a lot more points. You know, this is one of the highlights I want to point out is initially with Marvel's observation, if you look at the periodogram, you know, it's very hard to see the signals. And, uh, but with add this, you know, expert observation, now we very much determine the orbit's very eccentric one. And if you put that into this kind of a period and eccentricity, and this discovery is push the entire you know, eccentricity to the limits. So that does tell you that it's very interesting. It's uh, uh, you know, show that uh, you know, the very eccentric short period brought off, and then the plants like a you know, kind of uh, substandard company uh, you can find. But now, of course, we are turn the page to the you know, modern days. As you know, the most exciting thing is the last couple of years is highlighted by a few you know, candidates, you know, of this called habitable planets, you know, one is by, um, you know, uh, Hobbes, uh, uh, ESO, 3.6 meter telescope. So those uh, actually is uh, around like M dwarf, and they tend to be, uh, uh, you know, like a future Earth mass, and with, you know, 60 days, because the M dwarf is no mass, so the habitable zone is much closer. So th there's one candidate there, you know, is already, they actually, the team already found, I think right now, probably two to three candidates are right now, actually. And then Kepler, you guys probably know, you tend to have uh, quite a, a, a large number of the um, uh, habitable planet candidates. But the major problem with Kepler is the distance, you know, because they tend to be far away. So to follow them up is almost impossible. So therefore, the, the currently Kepler is, you know, only can turn into most of these habitable planets in, in, as candidates. And they're difficult to get confirmed because too faint. So therefore, the, you know, this is certainly is a major, you know, wave to push toward the habitable planet survey. The motivated by that, you know, our team, you know, we work on the third, third generation instrument. And here, I just want to show you, if you want to do radio velocity and uh, what the landscape looks like. Well, here is a landscape. You can see here, um, the, you don't have to, you know, look detail, but you just r roughly know, you know, the M dwarf, you know, from the M8 to all the way to M, you know, M, M, you know, M, M2. 
So that you can see here that this is the curve of the radial velocity accuracy. And uh, you can see here, and the habitable zone is this green zone. And uh, you can imagine you know, with this kind of, uh, you can imagine here, if you get you know, two or four meter radial velocity, you, know, you don't have a very high precision, but two to four meters per second. And then, then you can see here, the, um, uh, you, know, you can d discover about uh, you know, five, 10 Earth mass planets in this uh, habitable zone within about a couple of 10 days. Okay, it's a very short period, you can, uh, you know, which means um, the, if you're able to do this kind of radial velocity with two to four meter and uh, target the M4 or later, you pretty much can find this habitable zone in a few weeks, actually, even maybe in, in within a year. And then, of course, if you go on to the, uh, you know, K dwarf, and K dwarf will have the, you know, an even more massive, and then you can see you know, from K0 to K M4, you see the habitable zone is come from a few weeks to uh, probably like a, you know, 200 days. For that, of course, you need a higher precision. So you need pretty much, you know, you can imagine one or two meter per second, then you can still target about, you know, five, ten uh, habitable Earth-like planets, or even smaller. So this will tell you that, indeed, you know, if you look at the habitable planets in the next wave, you need a high precision. You know, in, in the sense, you know, optically, you need, a, uh, you know, one meter level precision. In infrared, you need probably like better than three meter per second. So that, because of this, you know, motivation and, uh, and the needs, so therefore, we pretty much design the instrument, to, you know, f target for that. And here, I'll show you the landscape. Then, where to focus our uh, radio velocity, you know, observation. And then you can see here, you know, if you just look at for, you know, G dwarf to the M dwarf, you can imagine, you know, for the G dwarf, K dwarf, the most sensitivity is in the optical, which means, if you have optical instrument, uh, even to the early M dwarf, you, you can use the optical instrument, and you can pretty much get to a meter level precision or better. So therefore, you don't need the infrared instrument. But once you get to the M9, M5, so infrared is, is the region you are in a focus on. So these basically tell you, if you want to do radio velocity to find the habitable earth-like planets, you need the optical infrared instrument. Optically, you target the you know, GK, you know, spell K, early M dwarf, and then the, um, for the for the you know for the um, uh, late M dwarf, and uh, you probably want to focus with the infrared spec well. So that's pretty much tell you you need two kind of instruments, and because of that, so therefore we pretty much already you know develop this kind of new generation instrument, and this is the first instrument we call first is because it's called Florida Infrared Silicon Immersion Grading, and the key elements is this is called Silicon Immersion Grading. It's developed by you know my team over the you know last the ten years. And that is a very deep, small device, but they make the grading onto the silicon. Therefore, you can make a very compact instrument. You, you may say, why silicon can do that? Because silicon is extreme high refracting index. It's 3.4, you guys probably know. So therefore, the, the light goes into the you know, silicon is a very much reduced the, you know, wavelength equivalent. So therefore, small grading can equal to very big size. So that is why you can use immersion grading. You can reach high precision, uh, high resolution. So here is the uh, your, your design is getting to a you know the typical like sixty thousand resolution, which is you probably heard of many times um, the, in the optical, but in infrared you can do that same way. So therefore, this is pretty much the instrument is already in the lab. This is chamber, and this is the telescope we try to you know collaborate with. Is uh, you know Tianjin State is a two meter robotic telescope. So therefore, the, we can you know visit the stars almost every night base. So they, therefore, you can you know target the not all habitable planets. So since my time is getting uh, short, so I just go quickly with the you know, square format. You can imagine, you know, 2K by 2K detector. You can cover almost entire 0 0.8 to uh, you know 1.35 micron in single shot. And then the infrared, you know, 1.4, 1.58. You can cover in single observation with this instrument. And here's our engineering data. You can see a beautiful immersion grading spectra. You know, this tungsten lamp is well resolved. And you see that this is a uranium lamps. You see the spectrum, well well resolved there. Okay. So I don't have time to go detail. You know, we are in the middle, you know, testing, and uh, hopefully we'll see the first night and later this spring. And uh, this is the survey, you know, landscape. Uh, I show you the plot. Our, you know, major target is M4 and uh, and later. So that will be this region. So you can imagine by observe, you know, within a few months, we should be able to, uh, you know, to, uh, you know, to reach, you know, uh, uh, you know, average about maybe three meter level precision. But of course, this is the red light is our pessimistic case. You know, M, you know, w uh, the black color is the kind of baseline. So we including all the kind of systematic errors, you know, from photons, from the you know uh, thermal lines, all kind of things. So they can imagine, and uh, with the two meter, you know, we can do a two three meter this kind of level. So therefore, we can pretty much can target a lot of this kind of habitable planets in in these habitable zones, and in, in the next uh, you know couple of years. Okay, and now switching back to the optical instrument, you know, we we de develop this kind of very high resolution spectrograph is very much close to 
hubs kind of uh, instrument resolution, and with one of the curves is, is even larger, you know, 3,800 to the 9,000 that's strong. And uh, this kind of spec graph is already built, and uh, in fact, in the middle to do the vacuum and, uh, and the stability testing right now. And, um, and uh, you can see here, you know, have the you know, vacuum chamber and then with temperature control and to very high precision level. Here's our, our lab, the first light. You see the, uh, the, you know, this is sunlight. You know, it's covered very broad. And uh, if you look carefully, uh, this is each spectrum, I could have four spectra there. You know, you know why is that? Well, that would take a bunch of this called a uh, you know, five bundle. You know, I mean, to build a high resolution spec graph, tend to be, you have to build a, use very high in your shell, like, a, like a hubs. You have to build a very big, you know, two meter or even larger instrument. That tend to be drop the cost. But here, we actually use a five bundle, which means that you can use a one fiber, you know, 80 micron fiber coupled to four, 40 micron fiber. So therefore, you basically slice the imaging you know, to smaller size. So therefore, give you the higher dispersion without going to big in instrument. That's the key. So that will drop the cost down by, uh, you know, eight times at least. You know, we are cost the instrument less than $1 million, but the hubs cost probably $8 million. So that's the tricks. And also, we, we open up a wellness cover as well. You can see here, this is the calibration. You see the four fiber with the thorium lamps, and here's the calibration light. So you can use the simultaneous calibrate the instrument. So I won't go detail. And here also, we uh, can enjoy a single fiber with a, with a, you know, with a thorium argon. So you can enjoy five, you know, 50,000 resolution. You can go on with maybe 15 magnitude, very faint object, you know, very velocity. For some of the people have very faint objects, you, know, you can use this one to observe all your targets in the future and get a very decent radio velocity. And here, just show you the you know, spectral re reduction. You see here, our you know, early reduction you know, is, is matched very well. You know, this is the similar data. These are our real data. You see, real data is, you know, tend to be even better than our similar data. So it's basically show you the very good uh, uh, you know, spec graph. And uh, here, I just show you the landscape, you know, what it can do. You know, I mentioned, you know, this optical spectra we want to cover from the you know, 0.2 solar mass to all the way to 0.8 solar mass, kind of, you know, K0 to M4. So, you know, if you search for a year, you pretty much cover the entire hypothesis. So then you can cover like a 5, 10 Earth mass kind of planets. Okay, so that's pretty much, I want to say, that is pretty much the instrument we're working, and probably we'll see the first night later this spring. And here, I want just, the, you know, to give you the perspective, you know, of course, and the, the good news is the Kepler already point out, and uh, there's you know every two star or three stars, if you stay there long enough, you probably are able to find other like planets. So therefore, there's plenty of bright stars, especially you guys doing double star. You know, you know there's a lot of stars in the sky. So you, you don't need a big telescope. You all need is the network. You can dedicate, you know, have twenty, you know, almost twenty four hours to monitor stars for months and months, you know, cadence. Then you pretty much. You know, with high precision, with no cost, with you know, not hotel time and robotic nature, then you can do um, um, you know this kind of survey. So you can search you know a couple hundred of these, then you'll find many of these potential habitable planets. So this is uh, one way to do that. Then you may say how to do that. Well, your instrument you mentioned, you know, our instrument right now, the third generation still costs about million dollars. Well, this is one way to do that. Use in the frontier. You know, like I point out, you know, use marvels, you know, kind of in the frontier and cover with the spec graph. You don't need a very high resolution. You only need a 10,000 resolution. This is the kind of a concept, you know, you can see here. It's 0.5 meter size. It's about this, you know, put in a, a showcase. And then uh, you can cover distant wavelengths, you know, 0.38 to 0.65 micron in the, with 2K by 2K. So therefore, you can drive the entire cost to a quarter million dollars or even less, you know, if mass production, for example. And this is our simulation show. Indeed, with that kind of a wavelength coverage resolution and with this in the front to help the, you know, the sensitivity, you can see here uh, we can cover to one meter level precision with signal ratio 100. So therefore, there's a ton of the bright star you can do. So that's the direction we want to head in in the, in the future, you know, to do this global network, to look for a lot of habitable planets. So now I just summarize here. And um, the summary is basically show you that, uh, you know, the UF, we've been uh, generating three generation instruments, you know, from the informator method, you know, that will give the very multiplicity gain. So you can do many object observation, but with moderate re precision. But then you can use, uh, you know, high resolution shell spec graph and that is give you the you know, better Doppler sensitivity. And uh, of course, our third generation instruments show that uh, you know, we are in the middle integration. So we're ready to, uh, you know, to do you know, survey and of habitable planets. And then for future, I want to point out you know, we can build this you know, very low cost and, uh, and robust, ro robotic you know, instrument graph and the work with maybe in the future with you know, Russ and the team and, uh, about this low cost telescope. Then we can populate the whole world you know, with this network. Then even amateur can help to do this kind of science. That's all. Thank you.